So today we're going to talk about cardiac muscle, which has many properties in common with skeletal muscle, but some that are different. And so I'll summarize briefly the main structural differences between cardiac and skeletal muscle, the main functional differences, which are both electrophysiological and mechanical, and then some important experimental differences involved in testing cardiac versus skeletal muscle. So structurally, cardiac myocytes, which are also called myofibers, as they are in skeletal muscle, are not fibers. They're these rod-shaped, also striated cells, but they're only 80 to 100 micrometers long and perhaps 20 micrometers in diameter. So they're really not a fiber by any usual definition of the term fiber, but they are called myofibers because of the terminology deriving from skeletal muscle. They also function like elongated fibers because they are arranged largely end-to-end -end in a locally parallel arrangement, and they are coupled tightly electrically and mechanically at junctions that are called intercalated disks. You can see the intercalated disks localized in this electron micrograph in the bottom. The cartoon at the top implies these empty spaces between adjacent cells, which you can't really see in the electron micrograph. But what you can see is the regions of tight coupling between cells where the intercalated disks are localized and that connect cells primarily end-to-end. -end. So these intercalated disks and these junctions are at the end of the cells, and they're primarily end-to-end, -end, but they're not all end-to-end. -end. So for example, here you see a junction at the end of this cell, but it's connecting this cell to a cell that's sort of more on the side than at the end. And on average, at least in the mouse, people have seen that one myocyte is connected via these junctions physically directly to 11 other myocytes. And on average, six of them are at the ends, so approximately three at one end and three at the other end, and then the other five are primarily around the sides. But the junctions between the cells localize at these end processes, and the intercalated disks contain important structures, including gap junctions. And the gap junctions contain channels that are called connexons, and the connexons, these channels, are formed by hemichannels, half channels in each of the joining myocytes that are called connexins. I should also comment that the myocytes are approximately parallel to each other so that they create a predominant muscle fiber direction. And because of the low electrical resistance of these gap junctions, electrical depolarizations propagate from one cell to the other. So no synapse is needed. The impulse propagates continuously from one cell to the next which has, gives rise to a term which physiology books use called functional syncytium. So it's as though many cardiac muscle cells behave like one muscle cell. It's a little bit of an oversimplified concept, but it refers to the fact that unlike nerve or skeletal muscle cells, the electrical impulse can flow directly from one cell to the next through these low resistance junctions. The other thing is that although the myocytes, the myofibers, are aligned locally with each other, sort of like bricks in a wall, they're not perfectly parallel to each other. You can see there's a certain amount of dispersion of their orientation. So within a small region, the myofilaments have an overall mean orientation that's in common, but you can see that there's some dispersion of that orientation, and statistically people have measured that dispersion to correspond to a, an ang a standard deviation in the angle of somewhere about 12 to 15 degrees. So they're approximately parallel, but they're not perfectly parallel. At the level of the whole heart, as we've talked about before, the cardiac muscle fibers are arranged into a spiral. Historically, the anatomists thought that there were different parallel fibered muscles that were wound into spirals, and there were different spirals that made up the whole heart, and those spirals had different names. But now we know that really the myocardium is a single muscle in which the muscle fiber orientations vary smoothly and continuously as a function of position through the wall of the heart. So the muscle fibers on the outside of the wall have a helical pitch that is rotated clockwise from the circumference by about 60 degrees to make a left-handed helix. And gradually as you move through the wall, that helical pitch changes. It gets lower till near the middle of the wall. The muscle fibers are running approximately circumferentially and then as you go all the way to the inside of the wall, in the endocardium, now they're tracing out a right-handed helical pitch with an angle to the circumference that's counterclockwise by 60 to 90 degrees. But there's no abrupt transition between these structures. 
there's a continuous variation. It's all one tissue with just a varying orientation of muscle. However, as we also pointed out, there is an equivalent to the fascicles in skeletal muscle, but they're not roughly circular bundles as they are in skeletal muscle. There are layers or laminae of cardiac myocytes, again organized by the extracellular matrix, and again the collagen matrix seen here in white shares the nomenclature that's used in skeletal muscle. So this this collagen here that wraps this layer of cells is called the paramecial collagen, whereas the collagen that's around each cell and connecting the cell to cell is the endomesial collagen, and the collagen that's around the whole outer surface of the whole heart is the epimesial collagen, the same terminology that's used for skeletal muscle. But the analogous structure to the fascicle or bundle in skeletal muscle is not really a bundle, it's a layer of about four cells thick, so you've seen here in cross-section. And you can see that those layers come together and branch, and then adjacent layers are separated by a looser connective tissue layer. Now, again, the implication of these scanning electron micrographs is that there's gaps between these sheets or layers of cells. Those gaps are really created by the dehydration process that's used to prepare the tissue. There aren't really gaps, but there are other cells, there are fibroblasts in there, and this paramecial collagen that you see here allows those layers to slide with respect to each other. And that's probably very important for the reason that these layers are there. Because as the heart wall shortens and thickens, it must shear. And these layers tend to be roughly 45 degrees to the orientation of the axis of the wall, which would be the axis of greatest shear, suggesting that these sheets are there to accommodate the shear that would otherwise cause damage if they were very tightly coupled. So here you see the same thing at a lower resolution, and you can see in the same way that in a small region of the muscle, all the muscle fibers have approximately the same orientation, so do all the sheets in a small region, but their dispersion is a little bit greater. However, as you go from region to region, the mean orientation of the sheets changes just as the mean orientation of the fibers change. Here is a cardiac sarcomere, which looks very much like a skeletal sarcomere. It has I band and A band and M line and C disc. The muscle the myosin isoforms tend to be the slow isoforms because cardiac muscle is a slow twitch. The troponin isoforms are different because the way that cardiac muscle gets activated by calcium is a little bit different than skeletal muscle. And the titan isoforms are a little bit different. In particular, they are the shorter titan isoforms that are therefore stiffer. And so cardiac muscle cells are stiffer when they're not contracting than skeletal muscle cells because they have shorter titan isoforms that are therefore a stiffer spring. So that's the structural differences between cardiac muscle cell and skeletal muscle. There are also functional differences, and they exist both in the electrical activation of the cells and the way the electrical activation is signaled to the mechanical contraction. And the main difference is that the cardiac action potential that you see on the bottom here is much longer than a skeletal or nerve action potential, and you've learned this in physiology, and you've probably learned that that's largely because of some slow inward calcium current that's important in cardiac muscle cells, and that calcium current contributes to the plateau of the action potential and makes the action potential longer. Later, the outward potassium currents contribute to the later repolarization of the action potential. And a consequence of this different sequence of ion currents is that the refractory period of the cardiac action potential is greater than the refractory period of a nerve or muscle action potential. Whereas in muscle cells, you can stimulate very rapidly, and you can see that was what gave rise to tetanus. In cardiac muscle cells, you can't do that. The refractory period is long enough that you can't stimulate the cardiac muscle cell at more than a few hertz. They won't elicit a second action potential before the previous action potential has had time to recover. And that means that you can't tetanize cardiac muscle, and that's very important because you don't want to tetanize cardiac muscle. If you did, that heart would stay contracted and then it wouldn't relax and therefore it wouldn't fill and then the heart wouldn't be pumping. So it's every bit as important that the heart relaxes as it contracts periodically in order for the heart to work as a pump. And hence, unlike skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle cannot be tetanized. The only way you can tetanize it is by treating it with drugs, for example, and then rapidly pacing or removing the membrane so that the ion channel is no longer 
come into play and experimentally people do that. The drug that people use is a drug that opens this ion channel here called the ryanidine receptor. And when you open the ryanidine receptor, calcium comes out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. You can end up having a sustained contraction that way. Normally you require a depolarization of the membrane and that inward calcium current to trigger the release of calcium from those ryanidine receptors via those ryanidine receptors from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then a calcium pump in the sarcoplasmic reticulum called the circa pump, the sarcoendoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase, because it uses ATP, takes the calcium back up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum until a new beat comes along, allows more calcium to enter through the slow calcium channel, and then triggering another calcium transient. So you get the action potential first, then you get the calcium transient, and then you get the force of contraction. And as long as the action potential is controlling the release of the calcium via the flux of calcium in through these calcium channels, as long as the action potential can't be repeated, then the calcium transient needs to wait before there'll be another calcium transient so this process is called calcium-induced calcium release. It depends on that slow inward calcium current. The calcium coming in stimulates the opening of the rayanidine receptor, which then results in the further release of calcium. And together, the calcium that came in from the cell, uh, from the outside, and the calcium that was released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum diffuse to the myofilaments, where they activate the myofilaments to contract. And then that circa pump, the SR calcium ATPase, resequesters the calcium that was in the sarcoplasmic reticulum back into the SR and enables re relaxation. And two membrane channels, the sodium calcium exchanger and the ATP dependent calcium pump, pump out the calcium that came in through the calcium channel so that you have an equilibrium. And usually about three quarters of the calcium that activates the contraction came from inside the cell, came from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the other quarter came through the calcium current. So that's the process of excitation and contraction coupling in cardiac muscle. It depends on calcium channels, T-tubules, sarcoplasmic reticulum, many of the things we've already heard about. But because of this direct coupling via the calcium current and the action potential, the ability to re-stimulate the cardiac muscle depends on the refractory period of the cardiac muscle cell membrane. And because that's long compared with a nerve or a skeletal muscle cell, you can't tetanize it, and that's what you want. So the final differences are what we want to talk about and spend the most time on are differences in testing. We'd like to do the same sort of test that we do in skeletal muscle, an isometric test and an isotonic test. But the first thing is that testing cardiac muscle is just harder because skeletal muscles are nice and thin and elongated and parallel fibers and come with conveniently attached strings at the end called tendons. So if you want to do a test of muscle mechanics, you can get a muscle from a frog or a, or a mouse that's nice and long and parallel fibered with tendons on the end and attach it to your apparatus and you're ready to go. And you can even do experiments where you have a control muscle because you know animals have symmetry. You don't have two hearts and so this is much, much harder. So the tissue preparation is a big problem. You can't extract a nice, thin, elongated, parallel fibered preparation. The commonest preparation that's used for testing the muscle mechanics or at least the best preparation in terms of getting the best biomechanical results are trabeculi. And these come typically from the right ventricle. The inner surfaces of the ventricle contain small projections of the cardiac muscle that often have little bits of valve attached to them. They have larger muscles, which are the papillary muscles, and some people use papillary muscles for testing, but they tend to be somewhat conical in shape, not very uniform. So the trabeculi tend to be thinner and more elongated, and they do have the advantage that they have a piece of valve or the tendon that attaches to the valve called the chordae tendinae attached to one end. An ideal preparation from a rat right ventricle could be as long as three or four millimeters, yet only 100 micrometers thick, so it's like a ribbon, so it's really a pretty nice preparation. And in terms of those sheets that we were just talking about, it's really just one sheet. In fact, the sheets are a maturation of trabeculi that are formed during cardiac development in the embryo. So the embryonic heart is very trabecular, and then those trabeculi compact into those sheets that we just saw. On the inner surface, there are some free trabeculi left that are attaching to the valves, and particularly in certain strains of rats, you can get nice long trabeculi that are a millimeter or two, three, perhaps four if you're lucky, long, but only 100 micrometers thick, which is about four cells thick. So a long, thin, ribbon-shaped parallel preparation. That's as good as you can hope to get. So that's the preparation and that's the hard part. You need to cut out a big piece of the wall to have something to grab onto at one end, 
and then you usually cut off some of the valve to have something to grab onto at the other end. Now you need to measure the force. Typical preparation would use some sort of resistive or capacitive force transducer that has to be fairly sensitive because obviously a small muscle like this doesn't generate a lot of force. And then you need to control the displacement. And so there are various types of transducers and motors that you can use. This particular diagram is over 30 years old. So a modern muscle testing system doesn't necessarily look exactly like this. But I continue to use this as an example because it sort of illustrates the kind of extremes people had to go to to get good data in the first place. And ideally, what you'd like to be able to do is measure sarcomere length as well. This is easy to do in a skeletal muscle. You can hang up a frog skeletal muscle in the lab and shine a laser pointer through it and see a diffraction pattern, as I mentioned. You can't do that in cardiac muscle because the cells aren't as perfectly parallel aligned and because the muscle preparations are more non-uniform and thicker. These trabeculi, when you can get a nice trabecula, they are ordered enough and thin enough and uniform enough that you can measure sarcomeres by shining a laser beam through them. But even when you do, the pattern isn't as easy to process as you get from a skeletal muscle. And that's why this apparatus here actually has two different ways of detecting the diffraction band that's caused when the helium neon laser is shined through the trabecular preparation. So they use a helium neon laser. And there's a, a formula for the spacing of the diffraction band, L, as a function of the diffraction spacing or the sarcomere length. And you can calibrate that usually by using a, a slide or something that has very thin black lines drawn on it at, at exactly one micron intervals. And then you shine your laser beam through that and you get a certain diffraction pattern and then you can work out the constant K for the wavelength of the light lambda. And now you have a calibration of the relationship between the angle or the the distance by which the light was diffracted and the sarcomere length or the diffraction spacing. So this particular historical apparatus used two different types of transducer to do this. So the laser beam is shined through. A lot of the light just goes straight through, sort of zero order diffraction. But some of that light gets diffracted. And so a mirror placed on either side picks up that each of the two diffraction bands that get generated on each side of the grating and focuses on deliberately onto two different types of transducer so that they could take advantage of the, the sensitivity of one versus the stability of the other. And this particular transducer here is called a lateral effect photodiode. So it's a very cheap, easy to acquire piece of hardware. This lens focuses onto the cylindrical mirror and then the light lands somewhere on this lateral effect photodiode. As you know, photodiodes are designed to detect the presence of light and produce an electrical signal when light lands on them. Lateral effect photodiodes, instead of making the signal dependent on how strong the light is, make it dependent on where the light is. So at one end of the lateral effect photodiode, you get a low signal, and at the other end, you get a high signal. So as the sarcomere length changes and the diffraction angle changes, and therefore the point where the light lands on the mirror changes, and therefore the point where the light lands on the lateral effect photodiode changes, you get a changing signal that's inversely proportional to sarcomere length. The other side does a similar thing, except it uses a cylindrical lens to focus the light onto something called a photodiode array, which is like a one-dimensional camera. And it just then some electronics process that one-dimensional picture to figure out where the dot is. Nowadays, we can probably rely just on the one-dimensional camera strategy and not worry about the lateral effect photodiode. But the reason I show this is just to illustrate the fact, whereas in skeletal muscle, it's really, really easy to do this. In cardiac muscle, it's possible to do it, but it turned out to be much harder. And that's the main message here. You can measure cardiac muscle in much the same way as you measure skeletal muscle, but you have to go to a lot more trouble to get a nice preparation and to attach it and to measure the forces and to measure the sarcomere lengths. So it's much more difficult to test the tissue structure is more complex and three-dimensional. You don't have the benefit of long, uniform preparations with tendons attached at each end. The best preparations are either isolated papillary muscles or trabeculi, which are more uniform than papillary muscles, but also very small. Cardiac muscle branching scatters the light, making laser direction more difficult, but not impossible. And intact cardiac muscle can't be tetanized, so 
that's the other problem. You, you, unlike in skeletal muscle where we can stimulate rapidly and tetanize and then make a measurement under steady state conditions, cardiac muscle is going to contract and relax and contract and relax. So you have to make your measurements under conditions of dynamically changing force. Or you have to artificially alter your preparation so that doesn't happen. And the normal way that people will do that is by what's called skinning. And the way they skin is by treating the tissue or a cell with, with a detergent. And the detergent pops hole in the membrane and essentially bypasses the ion channels. And then whatever the calcium is in the bath will go right to the myofilaments and it will cause the heart muscle to contract at a steady amount. But this is not quite as easy as it sounds because the amount of calcium inside a cardiac muscle cell is four orders of magnitude lower than outside. The membrane is there in large part to keep calcium out. So you actually have to put in calcium chelators to take calcium out and then gradually titrate the right amount of calcium in. So it's not as simple as it sounds. But if you do the skinning experiment, you can then control the force directly by changing the calcium in the bath, as opposed to by electrically stimulating. But normally, you know, in biomechanics, we're interested in the active dynamic properties, and so we keep the membrane intact and we stimulate electrically, and then we design our experiments to measure forces under dynamic conditions. So if you now want to do an isometric experiment, in a cardiac muscle preparation, you can hold the length of the muscle fixed and stimulate it electrically and get a twitch. And that's what's been done here on the left-hand panel and also on the right-hand panel. And you see two signals. The signal on the top is the sarcomere length from the laser diffraction system. The signal on the bottom is the force from the force transducer. And the first thing you notice is that even though the length of the muscle is being held fixed, the sarcomeres are actually getting shorter. As the force goes up, the length goes down because it's stretching other parts of the muscle, particularly parts at the ends. Now, remember what our preparation is. It's this tiny little muscle with a piece of valve on one end and a piece of wall on the other end that we're holding on to. So we're holding on to a bunch of stuff that is either not healthy or not contractile. And so when you hold those ends fixed, some of that tissue is going to stretch as the force goes up and therefore the portion of muscle in the middle that's doing the force generation is going to get shorter. So even though you held the muscle length constant, the sarcomeres were not isometric. And so here you can see by scanning the laser, so this is a, one of those trabecular preparations. And you can see it's very long and thin and uniform and the parts between 1 and 10 on the scale here are muscle. So they're all contracting and developing force, but they're also all shortening. The parts beyond 1 and 10 are where you start to get either the damaged tissue or the valves. And you can see the shaded portion on the bottom. That represents the part of the muscle that was actually lengthening as this central portion that's healthy and contractile shortens. And you can see that even by the time you get to the very ends at 1 and 10, the amount of shortening is going down. Okay. But there's a nice long interval in the middle between about two or three and a nine, where when you stimulate the muscle to contract, the sarcomere length decreases from about 2.2 microns down to less than 1.9 microns. So it shortens a lot. And that's because these damaged ends and non-muscle ends are relatively compliant. And so you generate a large amount of muscle force, it's going to stretch them a lot. So it's not isometric. This diagram on the right shows how that force changes as you stretch the muscle. And a somewhat unfortunate thing about the way this picture is drawn is that the scale on the third from the top, which says muscle length, is upside down. So this is 4.5 millimeters at the left. And then as the muscle length is gradually changed, even though the curve is going downwards, note on the scale that the muscle length is actually increasing to 6.5 millimeters. During the time of this, the relatively slow time of this experiment, you're stimulating the muscle at regular intervals seen here, and you're gradually stretching the muscle. You're stretching it slow enough that at any given twitch, the muscle length isn't really changing. But you can see that as time goes by for each consecutive twitch, that the twitches get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, which we also saw in skeletal muscle. As you stretch the skeletal muscle, there's an ascending limb to the length tension curve, more force gets developed. So this is just what we expect to see. At some point, we notice that the baseline force starts to rise. Why is that? It's because it's still a tissue. It still has stiffness. At some point, you'll stretch it enough. You'll stretch it beyond its slack length. And even when it's not contracting as a muscle, it still has stiffness. And that's the passive stiffness that you can see there. Okay. So it says that somewhere around about here, where this scale L over L max is perhaps 0.95, about right about there is about the slack length of the muscle. 
when you shorten below that length, it's just sort of buckled and floppy. But at some point, you'll straighten it out to the point where you're actually stretching the passive structures, and now gradually and nonlinearly, the stress will rise. So this is just a passive property of cardiac muscle, just like any other soft tissue we've seen. If you look carefully, you'll see that even though the total tension continues to rise, the difference between the resting tension and the total is starting to fall. Why is it starting to fall? You stretch beyond a certain peak, and the developed tension goes down. So this, if you were to look at the magnitude of this curve of the developed tension of the difference between the peak and the resting, it would go up, it would reach a plateau, and it would start to go down. It doesn't go all the way to zero, but it would look a lot like what we heard about in skeletal muscle, where there's an ascending limb, a plateau, and then a descending limb. So that's what people thought for a long time. They thought that, well, cardiac muscle is just like skeletal muscle. It has, and even is labeled on this scale, see this point here, uh, L over L max. L max represents the length of the muscle at which the developed tension was maximum. As we mentioned for skeletal muscle, it's close to, it's not exactly the same, but it's close to the slack length of the muscle, close to the point where the resting tension starts to rise. It's about two micrometers sarcomelia, just like in skeletal muscle. So everything we're seeing is just like in skeletal muscle. The main thing we're seeing is that the resting tension, the resting, the nonlinear stress strain curve here, is kicking in faster than it did in skeletal muscle, with the result that you can't actually stretch cardiac muscle out to the same kind of lengths that we did in skeletal muscle without irreversibly damaging it. So one of the important differences is that the passive stiffness of cardiac muscle is a lot, lot, lot higher than skeletal muscle, such that you can never stretch it for most of the interval of the descending limb of the isometric length tension relation. But nevertheless, according to these data, and according to data like this that many previous people had seen, the cardiac muscle peak isometric tension rises to a plateau at around about 2 microns sarcomere length, and then starts to fall beyond that. And you would think from the sliding filament theory, we would have a good explanation for that whole thing. But here's the catch. This isn't really isometric, because the signal underneath here is the sarcomere length. And we already pointed out that these muscles, because of the damage at the ends, as they develop force, they're shortening. Well, the more force they develop, the more they shorten. So not only are these muscles shortening, but they're shortening a different amount for different twitches. So how do we really know that this is a true isometric length tension curve? Well, the answer is we don't, and that's really what this paper was all about. So the two ways you can do the experiment, if you can measure the sarcomere length and control the muscle length. You can do what we've just seen, which was you can keep the muscle isometric, hold the length of the muscle constant, and then when you stimulate, the sarcomeres get shorter, and the tension goes up, and then the tension relaxes, and the sarcomeres relengthen. But that's not truly isometric as far as the sarcomeres are concerned. In order for the sarcomeres to remain constant in length, as the tension goes up, you'd have to stretch the muscle enough to counteract the amount of stretching that was happening at the ends to keep the sarcomeres in the middle at constant length. Right? And you can actually do that if you have a feedback servo control system like the system that we described. So what happens if you do that? If you stretch the heart muscle just enough that the sarcomere is no longer shortened, what will happen to the force? Will it be higher or lower? And so in fact, not only is the twitch higher as shown in the dotted line here, but the force actually rises faster and the twitch lasts longer. So Somehow, this not only affected the magnitude of the, of the tension, but also the shape of the twit, which is the details of which we don't need to concern ourselves with, but there's a big difference. So this is a true isometric twitch now. So what if we now plotted the peak of this twitch versus the sarcomere length? What would we see? We'd see something like this. And here on the left is the isometric tension versus the sarcomere length. The curve on the bottom is the resting length tension curve. As you can see again, by the time you get to 2.4 microns, that resting tension is rising rapidly. So you can never stretch it much more than that without damaging it. These curves represent just two different conditions. One is when the amount of calcium in the bath is relatively low, another when it's relatively high. Let's just look at one of them. Let's look at the one with low calcium. As you can see now, the tension rises, 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 but it doesn't reach a plateau and decline. At high calcium, the tension rises even faster, and it does start to level off. But even there, it doesn't really plateau, and it certainly doesn't decline. So these are the same data we were just looking at, but now plotted properly. And now it turns out that there's two different symbols on these graphs, a closed symbol and an open symbol. The closed symbol is when the sarcomeres were truly isometric. In other words, when the control system stretched the muscle to keep the sarcomeres at constant length. So those are the true isometric results. The open symbol is from 
the experiment where the muscle length is held constant and the sarcomeres are allowed to shorten. But importantly, because they were allowed to shorten, the sarcomere length at the time when the peak twitch tension occurred was shorter. So they plotted the peak tension versus the sarcomere length at that time. And when you do that, these lie on the same curve. So it's not a, somehow a, a complicated effect of the fact that you were doing a stretch in the middle of the twitch. In fact, the results are completely consistent whether you control the sarcomere length a lot or not. What you really need to do is measure the sarcomere length and plot the tension not versus the original length, but versus the length at which you measure the tension. And when you do that, you find, under conditions of low calcium or high calcium, that there is an ascending limb to the cardiac muscle isometric length tension curve, but there's no descending limb. There might perhaps be a plateau, but there's definitely no descending limb. So what you see in the previous slide here, the implication of a rising ascending limb of the isometric peak length tension curve, a plateau, and then a falling phase, because the amplitude of these twitches is going down, is entirely an artifact of the fact that the muscle is damaged and lengthening at its ends and shortening in the middle. It doesn't happen. Cardiac muscle cannot be stretched as much as skeletal muscle, and for that reason, you can't reach a good part of the descending length tension curve. But then on top of that, even though you can stretch cardiac muscle to a length that's long enough where you expect to see a descending limb, it isn't there. Cardiac muscle has no descending limb of the length tension curve. And the reason why a lot of textbooks still say it does is exactly because of what we've just been through, because of the artifact of measurement. Well, part of it has to do with the fact that the geometry of the cardiac myofilaments is a little bit different, such that the plateau is wide enough that you can barely stretch cardiac muscle to be long enough to where you would truly expect to see a descending limb anyway. So there's just a little bit of difference in the geometry of the sarcomeres such that they're really designed so that they won't have a descending limb. That's a good part of the answer. But the other part of the answer comes from a, a really unusual property of cardiac muscle called length-dependent activation. Now, this is one of those curves that's plotted a steady-state maximum force develop against the concentration of calcium and micromolar inside the cell. And remember we said that skeletal muscle has a very steep switch where you turn up the calcium a little bit and it goes from no force to maximal. Well, the same is true of cardiac muscle. So this is a log scale. When you go from one micromolar calcium inside the cell to 10 micromolar calcium, you go from zero force to maximal. So just one order of magnitude of calcium is just enough to completely switch on the cardiac myofilaments. The interesting thing, though, is that the specific sensitivity of cardiac muscle to calcium is actually very sensitive to the length of the muscle. So the more you stretch the muscle, the more rapidly the force rises with calcium. Or to put it another way, the less calcium you need to get the same increase in force. So somehow when you stretch cardiac myofilaments, they become more sensitive to calcium. And that's called length-dependent activation. So there's this kind of positive feedback phenomenon that tends to be that the more you stretch the muscle, not only do you tend to increase the number of available cross bridges, but you actually increase the activation of those cross bridges of those thin filaments by calcium. So you put these two things together, and the bottom line is cardiac muscle has no descending limb of the length tension curve, partly because the geometry of its filaments are a little different, and partly because the muscle is more sensitive to calcium at higher lengths. So these are the important differences. The shapes of these curves and many features are quite similar. So here's some real data on cardiac muscle activation, force versus, or the log of the calcium concentration in micromolar base 10. So this is 10 micromolar here. And what this is trying to point out is that when you have a calcium transient like this, and the calcium will rise, the force will rise quickly, and then as it decays, the force will fall. And because this relationship is nonlinear, what you actually find is that the calcium rises more rapidly than the force. So notice the calcium rise is quite steep but the force rise is a little slower. That's because of this nonlinear curve. But then conversely, the force decay is actually faster than the calcium decay. So part of this steep nonlinear cooperative activation curve is a property that enables cardiac muscle to relax faster. So not only is this steep calcium force relation a switch that enables the force generation to be relatively sensitive, it also turns out to be a way of accelerating the relaxation. And that's just as important as the contraction. Because if the heart could only contract rapidly but then couldn't relax rapidly, then it wouldn't have time 
to refill before the next heartbeat came along, particularly when heart rates get high. So the heart needs a way not only of quickly developing force, but quickly letting go as well. And this helps in the same way that you can do an isometric test with a little more difficulty in cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. You can do an isotonic test because the muscle is usually twitching. Rather than change the force and measure the velocity, people use the same sort of apparatus that we just described to do the converse experiment where you shorten the muscle under length control at a known sarcomere shortening velocity and measure how much the force changes. It's a completely analogous experiment. You just control the velocity and measure the force instead of controlling the force and measuring the velocity. And when you do so, you get a force-velocity relation that looks very similar to the skeletal muscle force-velocity relation, but interestingly seems a little more non-linear, a little more curved. Interestingly though, a group said, well, part of this shape of this curve would actually be affected by the resting viscoelasticity of the muscle. And we already know that the resting elasticity of the muscle is high, of cardiac muscle is higher than skeletal muscle. So maybe it has viscoelastic properties that affect the force velocity relation. So what they did is they measured the viscoelastic properties of the muscle passively by oscillating it at rest at different speeds. And then they factored out the contribution of the viscoelastic properties to the force velocity relation. And interesting, they found in that situation that the force velocity relation actually becomes linear. So the non-linear shape of the force velocity relation, as I kind of alluded to last time, is an empirical observation, but it really doesn't carry any deep physical meaning. The inverse relation is what matters, the fact that when the muscle shortens fast, the force is low. When the muscle shortens, doesn't shorten at all, the force is highest. And the shape of the curve is influenced by the viscoelastic properties, passive viscoelastic properties of the muscle.